Welcome to Hope Today. We are so thrilled that you've joined us. We have a great program for you today. I'm Tom Hollis. I'm here with Amy. I'm here with Sydney. And Sydney, we have, we have some really interesting things coming up. We do. I have a question for you. Are you a control freak or stress about every detail of your life and how it's going to pain out? Well, if you're nodding your head and answering yes, there's no judgment here. And coming up on Hope Today, we're going to unpack why we crave control and how agency is the key to real change with Sharon Hottie Miller. She's a pastor and teacher from North Carolina. Y'all, I know we all got control issues. We don't want to mention it. We don't want to identify and deal with it, but it's okay. We can take a deep breath. We're all going to be all right because we need to deal with control and how it creates this turbulence in our lives, Amy. There's, there's this long list of things I want to control, like my son's golf tournament today. I want to control that he wins, you know, the soccer games. They're headed back to school. I want to control my husband, the house, the dog, the church. I mean, there's so much to control. So, and there is a cost we're going to learn to controlling. Uh, you know, I, I used to think that I didn't have this problem of control until things started not being controlled or, or not happening the way I wanted. And I can, oh, Jean, she's shaking her head. Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, you got problems with control. We all do. <laughs> so even I think when I got married, mm -mm -mm, mm -hmm. I Come learned Jake would call things out. I was like, I got it, I'm fine. I don't have control <laughs> issues. And I'm like, Jesus, help me Lord. So we're all in this together. So it's really, like, we like having to unpack these issues and to encourage you and to help you out. And we have another issue that we're about to go into, Tom. Oh, well. oh, First, boy. I want to say this. If you feel like things are out of control for you, just remember, we always have a prayer line available for you. We always have a prayer partner standing by. You can always get somebody 24 seven. So call that number, pray with someone and let God be the one in control. Hey, that, that might be the secret in all yeah, this, right? Like right. God. Well, right now we're going to find out if we're going to lose control completely because we're going to try to stump the host. Okay, we have three questions, easy, medium, and hard, and we don't know, we've never seen these questions, and the three of us, you know, hopefully we know the answer, so play along with us. Here's the first one. According to Proverbs 1-7, the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. The beginning of wisdom. Thank you. Okay, we, that was pretty we easy. We very humbly were right. That was pretty easy. <laughs> but you know, last time I think we hit like one out of three. So we're going to see what I happens know. here. That's right. why we're humble this time. <laughs> we have to be humble. Very humble. Well, Thanks. here, here we go. Here's the second question. When Paul writes in Ephesians that the blood of Christ reconciles two groups of people formerly divided by the law, who is he talking about? The, the Jews, Jews and the Jews Gentiles. And Gentiles. Yeah. That's our final answer. Jews and Gentiles. Ding, 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 all ding. Right, all right, here, all we right, here we go. We're on a string. Okay. The, the third one. We got there. it. <laughs> Jew, yes, Jews and Gentiles. So our third one says this. Who says he actually wrote the letter to the Romans? Wasn't it Paul? Well, Paul wrote the letter, but it's who, but I who think the said. question is who actually, uh, you know, Paul had somebody writing for him. He kind of dictated. Paul Scribe. Uh, yeah, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Scribe, Mr. Scribe, was it? Do we have a lifeline? Uh, uh, Who do we call? I no, know. I don't know. I think we're, I think we're, we're swimming, we're stuck. So I have no idea. Wait, 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 wait. We, we, we've got a, uh, we've got who, someone. Who is his oh, assistant? We've got a guest. We could, we could call on our guest. Yeah, even. let's you know, do. Let's hey, put her on Sharon, the spot. are you there? I, I All right, you gotta, you gotta oh help us out, here, Sharon. You guys, this is not cool. <laughs> You know how we feel now. Right. Oh, Sharon, you can be sitting there Googling this <laughs> I know. I is it, is that while we're covering for you. <laughs> I don't know who it is. This is a hard uh, question. I'm sorry. We're sorry. We'll get, we'll get okay, to well, what. Okay, well, I need to know the answer. It's ter Tertius. Tertius, okay. Romans 16, 22. Mm. I knew it was somebody. Mm. <laughs> okay. That's a double. That double. This is like fixation. <laughs> oh, man. Two, out of, two out of three is not bad, so. Romans 16, 22. There you for go. those that are wondering, I'm sure to nobody at home this. knew this either. No, so. I mean, we, we're all in this together. It's all, we it, lost it control. If they did know that answer, maybe you should call us and maybe there's a job available. You could come help us every Wednesday on Stump the Host. There you go. Well, <laughs> well 
you know, you just saw that we completely lost control. And when we lose a sense of control of our lives, oftentimes it's followed by anxiety. And if you're experiencing those waves of emotions now or even during a previous season, today we want to help you. And that's why we have Sharon Hottie Miller joining us today on the program. You just saw her a moment ago. She was trying to help us out. She's an author, a pastor, and a teacher who leads Bright City Church with her husband, Ike, in Durham, North Carolina. And like most of us, she's come face to face with control issues in her personal life. Sharon shares her personal journey of what she's learned along the way in her book, The Cost of Control, Why We Crave It, The Anxiety It Gives Us, and The Real Power God Promises Us. Sharon, we're so glad that you were with us today to help us navigate this whole issue of control. Hi, I feel like I'm initiated into a friendship with you guys after that whole experience. So yes. thank you for that. <laughs> we have officially, we've bonded. And so yes. we're so glad you were part of that journey with us and shared. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so Sherry, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and how you just really unpack that, mm, I got some control issues. Yeah, so my husband and I lead Bright City Church in Durham, North Carolina, and our church is a plant. Our church is less than four years old, and when the pandemic hit, our church was only a year and a half old. And so leading a church plant through a pandemic is a great way to expose all of your control issues, and that's exactly what happened to me. So Sharon, to say like, I'm part of a church plant, so my pastors would echo your sentiments because they started uh -huh. the same time before and navigating a church plant during the pandemic is really, really rough. And how would you, you know, talking on this whole thing of control, how would you define what does control look like? What are the different facets of control that we can see in our lives? Yeah, so it's important to understand that control manifests in our lives in actually two ways. The first is this desire to exert our will on things, you know, in an absolute way. I wish I could fix this situation. I wish I could make this happen. I wish I could control the decisions that this person is making. And that's how we typically think about control. But control is also about how it makes us feel feel, the, the feeling of being empowered versus feeling out of control. And very often that feeling is actually what we're after. And that's one of the things I dig into in this chapter on the illusion of control, how it helps us to feel like we're in control of situations where we actually are not. But when you think you're in control, whether or not you are, it actually really helps you to feel better in the interim. So a lot of us are really after just that feeling. And you know, one thing I like that you shared in your book, you talked about there was a, a moment where you needed the control of understanding that there was a hurricane coming through and this control, mm -hmm. this tapping in to information. Can you unpack that for us a little bit? Because some people need yeah. that, you know, t digging into the news to feel that they're actually somewhat in control. Yeah, so I look at the different ways that we try to exert control and, and feel control in the world. And the number one that, that we we kind of overlook, but it's actually the most common and it makes sense because it's in Genesis 3 is knowledge. You know, Adam and Eve, they reached to, to have control in Genesis 3 by eating from a tree of knowledge. And that tends to be our go-to when we feel out of control is we take our control issues to the internet instead of to God. And we start researching and, you know, we're looking at what's going on in the news or, or what is what does the data say? This is how so many of us responded to the pandemic pandemic as we were, you know, trying to find out what, what does this virus do and, and where is it spreading and, and how do I keep myself safe? And so this is a really common and important to understand that when you are doing that, you're having a control response. You are going to knowledge, you're going to information to empower you and give you a sense of certainty and give you a sense of predictability that unfortunately it just cannot provide. And through that, that's where a lot of anxiety comes into play. So can you talk to us a little bit how like anxiety is like the symptom of control? Mm -hmm. so a lot of people aren't realizing like this is why you're feeling anxiety. I mean, anxiety is at an all time high. We've seen a lot of things with mental health issues since the pandemic. Can you talk for a moment about anxiety and its relationship to control? Yes. Yeah, so I just mentioned Genesis 3. And in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, they reach for control by eating from this fruit. And then they experience immediate consequences. They immediately experience anxiety. They imme immediately experience shame. They immediately experience division between them and God. And unfortunately, this moment becomes a blueprint for all of creation where all of us are now, in a sense, doomed to reenact this, this grasp for control 
you know, hoping that it will empower us. We, we do this again and again every day. We're reenacting this moment. But unfortunately, what we are also reenacting is its consequences. And so it's, it's not that this is an if, it's, it's a win. When you reach for control to rescue you or to empower you, you are going to experience those same consequences of anxiety, of, of shame, of, of relational division. And we experience this most often with anxiety. Whenever you try to control something you cannot control, it creates anxiety. And very often we, we miss that link because we blame the thing. We say, I feel this way because of the pandemic. I feel this way because the person that I love is making these decisions. And that is true to some extent. But what is ratcheting up your anxiety is actually trying to control a situation that you cannot control. And that is what is exacerbating your anxiety even more. And that was really, really helpful for me to understand because we get stuck in this cycle of feeling anxiety and reaching for control to soothe that anxiety. And it actually makes it worse. Mm, that is so true. It's like even what you're de describing reminds me of like codependency, where it's just like we're trying to soothe, we're trying to help, but it's actually it's taking a toll on us. And Sharon, I just want to talk, do you talk for a moment because you're, you're you're a leader, you have a church plant, and you mentioned in your book about how you notice even with power that there was mm -hmm. some control. Can you talk about that? Because I think a lot of people are right there don't want to admit it, but we need to dive mm -hmm. in and go to that place. Yeah, power is the more common form of control that we're all familiar with. But we think of it as someone who's creating a culture of fear, someone who is domineering, someone who is mm -hmm. aggressive. And I wouldn't have seen myself as a controlling leader. But I realized how many times I was trying to engineer outcomes, how many times I was trying to make my staff make certain decisions. And I wasn't being mean, and I wasn't yelling, yelling at them, but they couldn't say no to me. And what I discovered over time, and, and this is another cost of control that we see in Genesis 3 and that we reenact again and again, is whenever you try to control people, it will break your relationship with them. And this, this again, has, has been game-changing for me because I also lead the church with my husband. And so there have been times where I thought I knew this is the decision that we as leaders should make. This is, this is where we should go as a church. And I can coerce my husband, I can manipulate him, I can pressure him, I can make him make a certain decision, but it will come with a cost. And I might not see that cost today, I might not see it tomorrow, I might not see it for 10 years, but it will fracture <laughs> my intimacy and my relationship with him. And so that was also a, an, a huge epiphany for me to understand that link. Sharon, one of the things that we see a lot in society today is this kind of fractured, uh, we're, we're in our, our different factions, our different groups, and we immediately, there's knee-jerk reactions to everything that happens in government, everything that happens in politics or social issues. Is that a form of control? We sort of dismiss the other side all the time and say, this is, this is my group, this is my, this is, uh, we're, we're the ones that have the, the truth in this, and we kind of dismiss the other side. A hundred percent. So I mentioned that knowledge and information, we go to those to help us to feel in control, to help us to feel certainty and predictability. But we also use knowledge and information to try to control other people. We have this illusion in our mind that if I can just present the right argument, you know, the right information, the right statistics, and I can download that into another person's brain, that they will suddenly change their mind and agree with me. And I have just described 99% of comments sec sec sections on social media. Like that's what people are doing is, is saying, well, you just haven't thought of this. Like you, you, haven't, you haven't read this blog or, or seen this study. And if I just share this with you, it's going to change your mind. And that's how we are approaching one another. Really, this is again about control. And because of that, that's one of the reasons why our nation is just fracturing is we are trying to control one another with our knowledge and our information. And the fact of the matter is it simply doesn't work. Like I've, I've never encountered a comment section in which someone said, well, have you seen this study? And the other person said, I haven't. Oh, I'm completely wrong. Now I agree with you. That has never happened. <laughs> knowledge and information simply do not have that power. And when we use it that way, we just break everything around us. 
And Sharon, let's talk about another thing that is breaking something in the church that you dive into, and it's the prosperity gospel and control. Can you share your thoughts? Yeah, so that's another tool of control that I get into in the book is, is theology. And for anyone who isn't familiar with this idea of prosperity theology, it's this idea that if you just have enough faith, that things will work out for you, that God will reward you. And we see this prosperity theology in scripture when everything falls apart for Job, when the disciples encounter the man born blind, these, these people look at, the disciples look at the man born blind and they ask, who, who sinned? And that's prosperity theology, the idea that things didn't work out for you because you did something wrong. You, you disobeyed in some way. But really what that is, is that's about control. The disciples are reckoning with their vulnerability in an unpredictable world. And so they are trying to narrate faith in a way that makes them feel less vulnerable in a broken world. And anytime we blame people for their misfortune, especially if we say, well, you just didn't have enough faith or you just weren't a good enough Christian or you, you parented the wrong way and, and that, that's why this happened, that is actually exposing your own issues of control. Because what you're saying is, and that's why it won't happen to me because I'm a good Christian or I'm a faithful Christian or I'm a good parent or I don't do what they did. And that is all about control. Wow, Sharon, I think all of us are being touched in little control spots in our lives for decades. I've heard, let go and let God. And then when it comes to the end of your control, is that a true statement? And how do we actually do that? You know, it is true that we, we do need to surrender, that our lives are best kept in the hands of God instead of our own. And so it is deeply true. It's, it's deeply biblical. But part of the reason I wrote this book is that I also found that to be deeply unhelpful. <laughs> In the moment when I realize I'm trying to control and I think, well, I just shouldn't, I realize that this isn't, this isn't motivating me to, to behave differently. And so part of what did help me to let go of control was just realizing the cost of control but also realizing that, that God empowers us. You know, he doesn't say just lay down flat on the ground and let me do all the work, but he has empowered us and he has commissioned us in the world. And part of the reason that, that we, we gravitate towards control is that we have let go of the actual power that God has given us to influence in the world. And that is really good, Sheridan. The next point that we wanna hit on is about this whole idea of agency because that mm -hmm. is a tool that God gives us so we can release control. Can you break down what agency is and how it gives us back our own influence and power? Yeah, so one thing that I discovered is that God does not give us control, but he does give us agency. And agency is not a word that you find in the Bible, but it's it's a concept that that was helpful to me in describing what we see in scripture, which is that God gives us free will. You know, he in the Garden of Eden, we see that Adam and Eve are not in control, but they're they're not puppets, they're they're not robots, they're not prisoners. They they have choice, they have purpose. And they partner with God in that to influence themselves and to influence the world around them. And that's how I would define agency is it's this power to influence, but while also honoring our limitations and control doesn't want any limitations. Adam and Eve did not want any limitations, but agency honors the fact that I am operating within a certain set of parameters that I, I and I want to honor those. That's what agency is. I love so much that definition of agency. It's like acknowledging we have limitations and that's why we have to truly rely on God. Well, Sharon, thank you so much for just pouring your wisdom and your insight to us. Our book is called The Cost of Control, Why We Crave It, The Anxiety It Gives Us, and The Real Power God Promises. It's been such a joy to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. It was such a blessing. And we will be back and right in a moment. So we're going to speak into your heart and we're going to deeper unpack these control issues. And we know that the promises all rest in God. We'll be right back. Anyone can make predictions about the future. But what God says is what matters. And what does the Bible say about the future? 
prophecy expert Charlie Dyer delivers an insightful look at the end times, grounded not in human fantasies, but the revelation of God. Bible prophecy was never intended to tickle our imagination or satisfy our intellectual curiosity. God wants you to know about the end times so you can be confident in his eternal purposes. With a biblical understanding of the future, you'll be powerfully equipped to live with faith and hope today. Ask for your copy of What Does the Bible Say About the Future by calling 888-665-4483 or donate online at ctvn.org slash donate. Thank you for giving to Cornerstone Television. I wonder if you're like me and you're feeling all the control vibes that you need to just let go of and just hand back over to the Lord. It's true. Cast all your cares, cast all that control back on him because we are not in control over everyone and everything. Let's go to the scripture for some great wisdom in 2 Timothy 1, 7. It says this, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. Another translation of a sound mind. We haven't sometimes control the root of that. I mean, you got to say, what's the root behind control? Why am I trying to control this man, this person, or this child? Maybe you're in fear of something, fear of failure, fear of loss, fear of mistakes, fear of how it's going to make you look, just fear. But we haven't been given a spirit of fear, Tom. We've been given the spirit of self-control, self-control. I, I know, I didn't think I always wanted that spirit of self-control, but it's a fruit of the spirit, isn't it? And you know, guys, I was just looking the, right before that, uh, Paul tells Timothy to kindle afresh the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. So to, to re revive that spirit of God within, within us is a key to doing these things, to not have that spirit of, of timidity, but of power, love, and, and uh, actually New American Standard says discipline, to have the spirit of discipline. So, you know, those are things that sometimes we, we, we forget that it is through the power of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit. God wants to do that in you and me. He wants to do that, to have that kindled afresh. You know, I, I love that we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and we receive the power of God, but we, we need to have that infilling again, that rekindling, that refreshing of that of the spirit of God within us. And, you know, guys, I just think that's that's what we need today more than anything, Sid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you were talking, Tom, I just heard God was saying that there's a fear of the shaking that's going on. And so as you're seeing things shift, as you're seeing things that you were literally like losing control, I mean, we see even coming out of the pandemic, we had no control. We see in our lives there's no control. There we see that there's, there's so much shaking that's happening. But I truly believe that God wants you to know today that he is the prince of of peace. Peace is a person that you have to receive. And no matter what's going on, I just think of that word, that Hebrew word shalom, it's nothing damaged, nothing broken, nothing missing. It's an internal state despite what's going on. And so I just really believe that today, if that's you today, that you are just having, you just see things are shaking over here in the world. Things are shaking in the economy. Things are shaking in my family. Whatever it may be, receive the Prince of Peace and just be still before him. And I love that Jesus says is that, take my yoke and learn from me because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So even where you are and you're, when we go off the air that you would take a moment, you could even do it right now, is that you could just lay it down and be like, God, this is what it is. It's my, my family, my finances, my marriage. I'm worried about the world. Lay it at Jesus' feet. Yeah. And I have learned that when I see things that are shaking, I listen for his wisdom. I sit still and I'm like, what do you want me to learn right. from this? What do you want me to see from this? And I'm going to keep my eyes on you and I'm going to change the way that I think. And I'm just going to stay focused on the master because he is the one that has everything in his hands, Amy. You know, I come from a long line of worriers and, and I have spent sleepless nights. I've had many sleepless nights with many sheep, many children, many issues that kept me up all night. And I, I think about an example just this week. I get a text, it's late at night, it's 1130. It's one of those that just all of your insides just go 
and you want to control, you want to make the call, you want to make the ta- you want to do all of these things. And I mean, I just thought, I, I made a decision. I cannot control that. It's out of my control. So what I had to do was literally see myself shifting my mind and my thoughts to the faithfulness of God. And I just, I just thought I'm not losing a night's sleep. God, you're, you're the good one. You're the faithful one. And all my life you have been faithful. And I just started singing worship songs. And I just switched that track from worry and control to the goodness and the love and the faithfulness of God and gave it over. There's nothing I could do about it anyway. So I don't know why we would take things and stay up all night. So I'm asking you today that that you focus on the character of God. You focus on the goodness of God. The Lord is your shepherd. You shall not want. You shall not lack for any good thing. He is faithful. You know, I, I, I love that, that we're, we're, we're wanting to see ourselves give up that control. But I, I want to speak to someone. I've known people, and so maybe I'm just speaking out of my experience, but this might be a word of the Lord for you as well. And that is that you feel controlled by someone that you feel controlled by an overbearing parent. You feel, even from the grave sometimes, your mother or father, you feel like they were just so overbearing and they've they've put you in a place where you feel like you gotta please them. You feel like you gotta, and I wanna tell you, you can be set free today from those shackles. Mm -hmm. And if you feel like that, if you feel, then I want you to, to go to God and say, God, I, I don't, I don't want to live my life based on what someone told me. It could have been a teacher or a coach or something. And praise God for all the good influence all those people can have on us. That sometimes they can grip us and, and, and say things over us that we carry. And today's the day to let that thing down and to say, God, I want just what you say about me to be what is my banner and to be what is over me and all those chains can go. And as you were talking, Tom, we just right now, we declare and decree, we break every word curse that was spoken over you, those words, those negative thoughts, those things that people place upon you, they're broken right now in the name of Jesus. You come into agreement with God says who you are and you lay those things aside. You lay it all down at his feet. You are a new creature in Christ. Stand up in that and receive that today in Jesus' name. Well, we are so grateful that you joined us for Hope today. And we hope today that you would experience his love and his freedom like never before. Have a great day. On tomorrow's Hope Today, rethinking and reforming how the church does discipleship. Speaker and author Dennis Allen addresses the challenges Christian leaders are facing in the quest for making more disciples of Christ. Don't miss tomorrow's Hope Today. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.